I mean, that's just fun to be out there, you know, but it's very hard to tell them apart. I've done seed collecting a few times uh, out at Pharma Lab. Oh, nice. And it was hard to tell them apart. But I will get rolling now. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Catherine Bryla, and I'm on this. Uh, I'm a team member of Sag Moraine Native Plant Community. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are a 501c3 all volunteer nonprofit located in the southwest suburbs of Chicago. Our mission is to advocate for the use of native plants and ecological landscape practices in residential commercial and public landscapes. We do this through community outreach, education, and by providing resources to our community. We are thrilled to be, um, to have Kelly Schultz here as our guest tonight. Kelly is the uh, stewardship ecologist for the Lake County Forest Preserve District. And she is gonna be teaching us how to successfully collect and handle seeds from native plants. Ladies and gentlemen, Kelly Schultz. Well, thank you, Kathy, and thank you to all of the team members at SAG Moraine for inviting me here to talk about plants and native seeds, two of my favorite things. So I've been working in restoration ecology for 18 years now, and um, all the agencies I've worked for, we have basically the same two goals of number one, we want to protect these wonderful wild places, but number two, we are looking to protect species and keep them from going extinct. So for that first goal, um, we spend we spend time uh, working on uh, putting things into permanent protection in our districts whenever we can. Uh, but we also work on um, with private landowners to do easements and estate planning, as well as trying to inspire a few more people to want to plant a few more native plants in their yard. Uh, for that second goal of protecting species, this is where our restoration really kicks in. So we spend a lot of time and energy planting and seeding natives, um, wildflowers, but also trees and shrubs, vines, sedges, rushes, grasses, ferns, aquatic plants. I mean, whatever we can get out there to bring back that diversity of native species, as well as support a diversity of wildlife. Um, but we also spend a lot of time battling invasive species. And this can lead to this misconception that we hate all non-native species. That's not true. Um, like I think Japanese maples are stunning. And I get very excited to see crocuses every year and I grow tomatoes and none of those species are native to this region. But none of those species are invasive in our ecosystem. And those species also have plenty of places to call home. In contrast, it's a pretty special place that can support purple fringed orchids or 200 year old oak trees, um, sandhill cranes, blandings turtles. These are the types of species we wanna make sure that they also have plenty of places that they can call home. And a lot of what makes us so passionate about this is looking at what's left. So I work for the second biggest forest preserve district. We have 31,000 acres of land and it is a lot. It's 11% of the county. And that means the largest landholder in Lake County is you, the public, um, which is pretty cool. It also means we have a lot of land and it takes a lot of hands to get this work done. So we really appreciate that we have so many wonderful volunteers joining us at our restoration work days. We have volunteers who help us with cutting buckthorn, collecting seed, um, planting oak trees. We have volunteers who help at our seed nursery where they help cultivate some of these rare plants. They plant, they weed, they collect seed and process hundreds of pounds of native seed every year to support these restoration efforts. We have volunteers who help with community science monitoring, helping us to count um, frogs and butterflies birds, rare plants, and all sorts of other species. It takes a lot of hands to get this work done. But, you knew there was a but coming, but with 11% in protection, that means about 90% of their habitat has been lost. And as we all learned in quarantine, when your world shrinks that small, you can survive, but you are not thriving the way that you used to. And if there's other stresses layered on top of that, that is gonna push some individuals over the edge. And that is what our native plants and animals are dealing with every single day. So we really want to um, try and, and do what we can to support these species, restoring the ecosystems to be as healthy and resilient as we can. Um, obviously I'm painting with a broad brush saying that we're the only agency, obviously we're not. 
there's lots of wonderful conservation partners, nonprofits, park districts, DNR, private landowners doing amazing top-notch restoration in our county. But I will also be the first to tell you that not every square foot of our district is in great shape yet. So, um, you know, maybe only 80% of their habitat has been lost, but it's, it's significant. And so anything we can do to help support these species and is really gonna pay off. So we're always looking for opportunities to build connections. Like where are there places we could put in corridors, whether that's a greenway or a blueway, something that helps connect up these preserves and other protected spaces so that plants and animals are able to move back and forth. We're also interested in opportunities for way stations, these little, little sanctuaries that support the aerial species, your butterflies and birds, but also pollen and some of our seed flies around on the wind. So where are there opportunities to put in some of these little plots, such as maybe your backyard? Um, and we have lots of opportunities where we can tuck in a few more natives that, um, you know, maybe, you know, maybe think about all the bajillion miles of turf grass you see every single day, that maybe there's an opportunity in your HOA community grounds. Maybe there's an opportunity at your place of worship or your place of business. Um, I lived in Elgin for many years, a town of 108,000 people at the time, and the city was starting to add uh, bioswales into our parkways. And so we were having these wonderful wildflower gardens pop up in our 1940s neighborhood. It was awesome. Um, we have scouts that are planting butterfly gardens at school or at the public library. So we have opportunities where maybe we can tuck in a few more natives. And this really matters not only because of the habitat loss, but also because plants and animals don't really understand all these human boundaries we put up. Like a two lane road, um, you know, typically not a, a significant barrier to you and me or to birds or deer, but to a turtle or a seed that falls on that asphalt. That is a big deal. So anytime we can have these connections and offer more opportunities, it matters, especially when you're looking at species like the monarch butterfly. I mean, talk about a species who does not understand boundaries. It's flying across countries, um, making their amazing migration right now. So it's a great time to get out and see the monarchs. And the craziest thing about their migration is no individual butterfly can complete it on their own. It is three to four generations that occur in that single round trip. So just imagine waking up and saying, well, you know, I don't have any family around me, but I think today I'm gonna fly to where great grandma was. How do they know that? How do they have this idea of where to go? How many of us know the town that our great grandparents lived in, let alone how to navigate there without Google? But these little bug brains do. And what's imperiling their migration is not any kind of issue with this GPS ESP thing they have going on. What's imperiling their migration is lack of habitat. We can fill our forest preserves with milkweeds, but if there's not enough milkweeds along the way, we don't get to enjoy the butterflies. So if you're wondering if it matters, it does. Every little native garden can help support these wonderful species and help it, us all to appreciate them for many, many years to come. So hopefully you're all feeling a little extra inspired to want to plant a few more natives. And the next question usually is, great, so how do I get my hands on some of these wondrous species? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, as far as I know, every single forest preserve district does a native plant sale, as long, along with um, some of the park districts, soil and water conservation districts, there's nonprofits, uh, garden clubs like Wild Ones will do native plant sales. For us, usually we do a full weekend in May, but because of COVID, we opted to put it online the entire year. So we partnered with Possibility Place Nursery, which is based in Moni, Illinois, south of Joliet. And you can go to our website, lcfbd.org. You'll find the information to order plants. And when the plants are ready, they will deliver them to you. And they've been busy growing more plants to try and keep up with demand all year, which is a great problem to have. Uh, we also have October coming up. So I don't know if you know this, but in Chicago wilderness, October is Oaktober, the month of oak awareness. So we have a native tree and shrub sale coming up. Um, that is in person with timed entry to, to minimize the cooties and there'll be staff on hand to help answer questions as you pick out your native trees and shrubs. We also have a bunch of virtual programming going on. So if you're interested in that, you can sign up on our website and tune in from whatever county you're living in. 
Um, but do check out what your local districts are doing and the Morton Arboretum and many of these partners are celebrating Oaktober too. So um, you also have an opportunity being a part of this group that you can turn to your fellow SAG Moraine members and say, well, friends, I have purple coneflower seed. Would anyone be interested in trading with me? I would especially love some milkweed. Now you have an opportunity to get some free seed to add to your gardens and add some more diversity. And seed collection is really easy. It is fun. I have worked with people ages seven to 87. Um, you don't need a lot of fancy tools. You need your hands. You need maybe a pair of hand pruners for some of the species and then a bag or a bucket or something to put your seed in. And that's about it. The challenging part of seed collection is knowing what am I looking at? I no longer have bright petals to tell me what this is and how do I know when and how to collect it. We've got a brand new hot off the presses resource to share with you, which you should have received already in your email. And I'm gonna share my screen so we can look at this together. Hopefully you all can see the PDF there. If not, unmute and let me know. Yes, we do see it, Kelly. Thank you. So in this guide, um, we have 60 different native species, which are suitable for, for landscaping and readily available from the commercial market. And it doesn't matter whether you're doing a rain garden, a pollinator garden, a shade garden, there are species in here for you. Now this content in here was developed with Gail Shields, an incredibly talented volunteer in Lake and Cook. Um, decades of restoration knowledge, amazing photography skills that you can already see here, as well as a wonderful mind for details. I could not have made this without his help. So in this guide, um, you'll see 60 different species and you'll see first of all, the name. So you'll see the English name, the Latin name and the plant family name. Um, if you know these plants by other names, you're not necessarily wrong. By the way, many of these plants have other nicknames in English, especially in different regions. Um, and the Latin names have also undergone a lot of changes as we do more DNA research and just better understand how plants are uh, related on the tree of life. And then below that, you will see the photo date because Dale is really good with details and he wanted you to have a sense of when you might harvest this seed. Now with photo dates or any resource that tells you when to harvest wild plants, I want you to use these dates as guidelines, not gospel. Because um, if I'm watching bergamot in Barrington, which is the Southwest side of Lake County, and I go out and I see the very first ones ripen, and I know that I also wanna collect it in Gray's Lake, which is the center of the county, uh, it's gonna be generally a week or two later in Gray's Lake, and the state line will be a week or two after that. So this is a pretty normal thing that it's, it's two to four weeks from south to north across Lake County. And we are not that big of a county. I'm looking at you, Cook. So expect that there's going to be some differences in where you're located. We also have a similar variation from east to west because we're next to Lake Michigan. And so we have lake effect, which isn't just an effect on us humans, but that also affects the conditions for blooming. That affects your conditions for the insects that pollinate. And that affects the conditions for seed ripening. You're also going to have microhabitat variations no matter where you are. I mean, you guys are gardeners. You know this better than just about anyone. If I plant bergamot on the south side and the north side of my house, I expect the south side to be a little bit sunnier, a little bit warmer. The seed should ripen a little bit faster. And all of this is assuming that all of these populations have the exact same genetic lineage, the exact same adaptations. And of course, they don't. That's a good thing with wild plants. We want them to have variation. It makes them more adaptable to survive what happens. These are not GMO plants. And of course, this is also assuming that our climate is normal and stable. And of course, that isn't true either anymore. Thank you, climate change. Um, this year in Lake County, we've been in a severe drought pretty much the entire growing season. And with drought stressed seed production, uh, typically there's two different, two different responses in plants. Response number one is the plant says, Oh, hell no. We are not having babies this year. This is a year for self-care. I'm going to save my energy for me and we can talk about kids next year, honey. So we're seeing that in a lot of our plants where they are aborting their seed. And that could be that the flower just fizzles up and you don't get any kind of seed production. Some species we're seeing that there's um, 
seed pods forming, but the seed inside is really small or shriveled and just not viable. There's not enough energy to support a viable seed in there. The other response that you might see in a drought, drought stressed plant is that it actually makes a ton of seed because it's saying, yikes, I don't know if I'm gonna survive this year. And so I wanna make sure I put all of my energy into making lots of seed so the population can continue even if I don't. And we're seeing that as well, that some of our species are really, really productive this year. Hopefully next year will be a little less stressful on the plants. But the point is to use these dates as guidelines and to put you in the right ballpark and then watch your plants. Your plants will tell you when they're ready. Uh, most of what I learned about seed was just being a big old nerd and staring at plants and watching how they change through the year. And then I was lucky enough that I had two jobs with greenhouses so I could test whether my instincts and observations were correct. But you can learn a lot just by watching these plants and then compare it with the photos in here and the captions. So looking at those photos, the first picture will generally be kind of a big shot to show you, you know, is the seed on the top of the, on the top of the plant or is it hidden underneath? Where would I start looking for this? Sorry, that threw me off that it said close up of a tree. Bergamot is not a tree. Um, and then you'll see a series of close-up shots of the seed pod and seed itself. And so some of these images are against a ruler. This is a millimeter ruler, or you'll see it against this gray and white grid, which is Dale's photo table, and it's a one inch grid. But either way, you'll have that neutral background and a sense of scale. So you get a sense of, of what you're looking for and how to hone in on the details. And then underneath, you'll see the captions where I describe what it is you're looking for, um, what you're, you know, when and how to collect it, as well as if there was any extra space left in the caption, I tried to squeeze in some fun little factoids about why I think this plant is fun or interesting and hopefully help you love the plant too. Now, the start of every caption, you will see a category or two listed describing what type of seed it is. And those are described at the first two pages of the guide. Um, there is lots of great information on these first two pages. I mean, of course I say that I wrote it, so obviously I think it's brilliant. You should all just memorize it. Um, but I want to draw your attention to this bit about ethics and sustainability, meaning please use this power for good, not for evil. Everything in forest preserves is protected. Please don't poach seeds. It may look like we have plenty of seed in the forest preserves and nobody would care if we took some, but it's that 11% there really isn't as much as, as you think. Um, if you wanna collect in the forest preserves, come join us. We would love to have you. We have all sorts of restoration work days going on in all the districts do right now. And September and October are like, oh, for seed collectors. There is just so much good stuff to collect. We are trying to just get truckloads of stuff as much as we can to support our restoration efforts that we're doing. And at these work days, you'll get free hands-on training from people who know and love native seed. You also have the satisfaction of knowing that your collection efforts are supporting your local area. So a lot of times these work days, we're collecting to literally move it from one side to the other of the forest preserve. Like maybe we just cleared out a whole bunch of buckthorn on the west side. So we're on the east side now collecting bottle brush grass and Joe pie weed and brown eyed Susan to bring over to help the recovery from that buckthorn. And if it's not used in the exact same site, it's generally going into a mix to support other forest preserves in your district. I mean, like 99% of our seed, that's where it goes. Um, and if we don't use it in our preserves, we're generally trading with other local districts to help support restoration efforts and get more genetic diversity. So come join us. We'd love to have you at our work days. Um, the other thing to remember, no matter where you're collecting, is to collect sustainably that um, I left in the percentages we use in the wild. We never ever want to harvest 100% of our seed. Most of the species you encounter are going to be perennials in the native world. And so for that, we use the 50% rule that you're leaving at least 50% of the seed to keep that population going strong. For my own garden, I'd probably feel comfortable being a little bit more aggressive and maybe I'd collect 75% to give away. Um, but the point is, I want you guys to feel comfortable collecting and sharing seed with each other, but don't forget to reserve some of that seed for yourself in your own garden so that it can continue to be beautiful for many years to come. These plants don't live forever. You do need to reseed them periodically. 
that's even more true if you're dealing with the annuals and biennials. Um, we typically only harvest 10% of that seed because without new seed, those plants die off very quickly. All right, so the seed groups I mentioned that start off your captions. Um, so these seed groups are the descriptions of how the seed disperses in the wild. And some of these are real and in other publications, some of these are Kellyisms. So do read the, the descriptions on the first two pages if you have any questions or, or ask me tonight and I'll be happy to try and translate my brain if it doesn't make sense on paper. Um, Cause yeah, I don't think my brain works the same as everybody else's. But if you understand how the seed is dispersed in the wild, um, you'll understand a bit more about there's trends and how the seed tells you that it's ripe and how you need to harvest it. So we're gonna highlight just some of these tonight, um, starting with my all time favorite method of seed dispersal, which is the ballistic seed. These guys, these are plants that have said, no, you can't live in my basement till you're 40. You need to get out. And to make sure that happens, I'm going to literally catapult you away like 20 to 30 feet from mama. It's really incredible. There are these amazing videos on YouTube you should all watch. My favorite one is a Smithsonian video set to the tune of the 1812 Overture. So you have this great symphonic work with cannons. And as the cannons are firing in the audio, the seeds are flying in the video, it's epic. So ballistic seeds in a garden. Um, first thing is these are the types of plants that are probably gonna pop up in some places and you'll go, I don't think I planted that there. And you probably didn't. The plant is seeding itself around your yard. So one way to control the natural spread of these, if you wanna contain them and keep your garden somewhat organized um, is you collect 100% of the seed and then re-sow it immediately in the areas where you'd be happy to see more of these popping up. For ballistic seeds, there's two methods for successful collection of the seed. Method one is you learn the steps of the seed ripening. And we'll look at an example of this in a little bit. Um, but basically these plants have kind of a ready, aim, fire sequence. So learn that and collect it at the aim stage. And that could be a physical change. Some of these plants will actually like raise their heads up to the sky before they pop open. Um, other species, it's a clear color change. Um, when you collect this way, you then wanna put the seeds inside of a paper bag, close it up and secure it with a chip clip or a clothespin or something. And then you'll hear this sound like microwave popcorn going off. If you wanted to collect 100% of your seed, typically you'd be checking these species every two or three days because there'll be more seed ripening. Or check it every, you know, once or twice a week and the ones that you don't collect, that's your 50% you leave behind. That works too. The other option for collecting ballistic seeds is to actually cover them with a mesh hood. So we do this with no CM mesh. You could use pantyhose or any kind of really well, great I didn't know fabric. Them, but, well, uh, yeah. You don't want to use a thick because you'll yeah. get mold formation if it's oh, not breathing appropriately. Um, and to do this method, you want to make sure your plants have been pollinated already. So look for wilting flowers or better yet, green seed pods forming. And then you're going to go ahead and cover up your plant with your mesh hood. And you'll tie it on top. So you're covering up the entire seed head just put a string around it. And then the seeds will pop, but they'll hit the inside of that hood and just settle into that area. If you do this method, you can now wait three or four weeks if you don't mind looking at these little Halloween ghosties on your plants for that long. When you come back then, you wanna just give your whole plant a haircut. So below the string, you're just gonna cut the top of the plant off, hood and all, and then you can take it someplace where you can carefully untie it and get to your seeds that are sitting loose inside of that hood. Um, most native plants do well with haircuts, by the way, that these plants are used to being grazed on. So if you have the, if you prefer to be the type of gardener to shape your plants, go for it. You can absolutely haircut just about every native species. And in fact, I often recommend it because these, these native plants are used to being in very competitive environments, very poor soils. And then we bring them into our gardens where we've amended it with all this lovely compost and they've been grown in a greenhouse with fertilizer. And that plant that should be, you know, a nice petite plant is all of a sudden three feet taller than it is in the wild. So if you feel like some of your plants are just a little too, too robust, um, give them a haircut, do it early in the year before the, the flower buds have formed, but you can do that. It'll generally give them a bushier shape too. 
All right, um, time sensitive next group is the fluffy seeds. So fluffy seeds like dandelions, um, but we also have many native species with fluffy seeds, asters, goldenrods, blazing stars, joe pieweed, ironweed, um, pussy toes, Indian plantain. There's a whole bunch of species that do this. If you can grow your own feathers, this is a great way to see the world. So um, if you imagine dandelions, because I imagine that all of you can imagine dandelions and maybe not as familiar with Joe Pieweed seed. Um, you start out with this wonderful butter yellow flower, which then after it's been pollinated, closes up so that the sepals, the greenery behind the flower will close up around it and the yellow will fade. And you'll see a little bit of fluff start to form at the peak. And then it opens back up again into that full globe of wishes. Our native plants do basically the same thing. So if you want to collect fluffy seeds, collect them when they're fluffy. It can be the full wish globe. That's ideal. Your seed is absolutely ripe at that stage. Um, but I've also collected them when they're closed up and you just have fluffy tips. And I started doing this out of frustration because a lot of our native plants, you'll have a single stem will have a whole bunch of flowers on it. And some are fully poofed, some are kind of closed up. And I just thought, I'm picking off individual little pom-poms of seed on this one aster plant. And I come back the next day and there's more that fluffed. So I just tried, if at least, you know, like a third, at least a third of the, the flower heads on that single stem have fully poofed, I go ahead and snip the entire stem, put it in a paper bag. And I found that they all visually seemed to ripen like a tomato on the vine. And then because I had a greenhouse, I was able to grow with that same seed and I always had good germination. So my recommendation is, you know, full fluff is ideal, but collect them anytime you see fluff at all. Um, milkweeds. Milkweeds are a specialized type of fluffy seed. They also grow feathers just like our other fluffies, but they're contained within the milkweed pod. So with milkweed pods, they're gonna have a vertical seam and you wanna see that split open. That is the only thing you need to worry about. If it's the milkweed pod is open, collect it. If the milkweed pod is closed, don't. That's it. Um, cheater's tip, if you are going to leave town for a week or three, you can buy yourself time by putting a rubber band around it like a belt. The pod can split, but it can't open up fully for the seeds to fly away. And then the last time sensitive group I wanna talk about tonight are the berries. Berries are different from other seeds in some really critical ways. And this all comes down to the fact that berries want to attract attention and most seeds do not. You know, being attractive takes a lot of energy. I know you ladies are all shaking your heads yes right now. You know what I'm talking about. And plants have this amazing ability. They grow leaves that turn sunlight into energy. And they grow these roots that pull out nutrients from dirt and water and everything they need. And they then convert it into flowers. And these gorgeous flowers, this is like squeezing into that tight little dress and those uncomfortable heels and putting on your lipstick, all of an effort to say, hey baby, come pollinate me. They do this for the bugs. We're just the accidental beneficiaries of all this beauty, but it's all about the insect pollinators. And after they've been pollinated, now it's time for sweatpants. It's time to be comfortable. It's time to be subtle. It's time to protect your babies and camouflage them. You'll notice that most of the seeds that are ripe in the fall tend to be colors of fall neutrals. Lots of browns and beiges, some whites and grays. Whereas your early ripening seeds, your May, June, and some of your July seeds tend to be shades of green. It blends in with all the greenery that's around that time of year. Berries are the exception. They want to attract attention. They are trying to get uh, a bird or a mammal to come eat their seed and then take their babies miles and miles away. It's a great way to see the world as long as you have all the right protective measures in place. Because for most seeds getting eaten, that's game over. So if you wanna collect berries, the first thing to know is there's always gonna be a clear color change because they wanna attract attention. So that's really all you have to look for. Is it, is it the right color? If it is, pick it. Um, the other thing is ask yourself, 
this berry plant that I have, what's my primary goal? Do I want to have this plant so I can collect it and grow it? Because that's a great goal to have. Or do I want to have this plant to support wildlife? Because that's also an important goal. Either one is great, just decide for yourself. If you want to collect it for yourself so you can propagate it, um, pay attention to these berries so you don't miss it because they will get eaten. Not every berry will get eaten quickly. Um, you start to get a sense for which ones are delicious and which ones are not. So like the image over here on the right side, this is Amelanchier, the Juneberry service berry group. Very, very tasty. These get eaten right away. So if you wanna grow them, you gotta get out there and like elbow the birds away or cover it up um, versus like buckthorn, which tends to hang on to the plant for a while Buckthorn's a laxative, and most of the birds have figured out, I don't really like that. <laughs> that's, that's not a good day for me. I don't want that, that fruit. Um, so those tend to hang around for a while, and only certain species will eat them, or they get eaten more often when there's fewer food choices around. The next thing to understand with berries is the natural processing of the seed. So these are seeds that are chewed up. They have to survive digestion and stomach acids, and then they're finally deposited into this steaming pile of fertilizer. So if you want to grow these seeds, there's a few um, barriers in place to protect the seed that you need to understand. The first one is usually in the berry itself, that there's usually a chemical inhibitor being sent to the seed inside of that fruit. So if any of the fruitiness is attached, it's sending out a signal that says, hey, don't germinate yet, we're still delicious. So if you wanna grow this, you need to remove the fruit. Um, put on gloves. A couple of these species reportedly can cause skin irritation. I've never had a personal issue, but um, put on gloves, remove the, the fruit, give it a quick rinse, you're good. The second layer of protection for the seed has to do with the seed itself, that it usually has a thick or extra hard seed coat. And so through the process of chewing and digestion, that wears down that seed coat enough. Um, for gardeners, I would suggest that you guys remove the fruit and then plant it in the soil sooner than later. And when you plant native seeds, you don't bury them very deep. Most of them, most species will germinate right on top of the soil. Berries, I would suggest you put maybe a quarter inch into the dirt. That's it, quarter inch. Um, but the soil microbes and the freeze thaw cycles should break down that seed coat enough that it will germinate for you. Because the point is to wear down the seed coat so that water can get into the embryo. Um, if you get to the point of doing pounds of seed like we do, we use a dull blender or we use fermentation, but I don't think that's necessary for the scale that most of you are going to be working at. The final thing to remember with berries is if you're not able to store it, if you're not able to sow it right away, you need to store it for any length of time. You know, chewing with saliva and stomach and all those fluids and the final deposition, that's not a dry process. This is not Indian grass in the September sun. So these seeds need to have some moisture if you're gonna store them. Um, so the best way to do that is put it in plastic. So a plastic bag or a Tupperware, close it up, put it in your refrigerator or your freezer. You should see a little condensation forming inside that plastic, that's perfect. That's what you wanna see. And you can do that with or without the fruitiness still attached. Um, but that's, if you're gonna store them, don't store them dry. All right, moving on to the not so time sensitive ones. On page two, you'll find the ones I lovingly call mama's boys because these say seed will hang on to mama for quite a while, which is great. You have lots of time to get your hands on these seeds. Um, the first group of mama's boys are the shakers. So these are a plant where you have like an open container and your seed is sitting inside. And then as the wind blows or an animal walks by, your seeds are shaken out. Or if that isn't enough, when the snowpack comes and flattens it to the ground, the seeds are shaken out at that point. So for shakers, um, the seed is sitting at the base. And if it's not ripe, it should be really fixed to the base of the plant. Once it's ripe, it kind of dries up and loosens up enough that it's just rattling around. So all you need to do is tip it into your hands, that whole seed head. And if any seed falls out, then you know, oh, it's ripe. I can pick it today. So I usually do that test and then um, you can either shake them individually into a bucket as you go. Most of the time I just do one to test it and then I just start snipping seed heads so that I have whole bunches and I can process seed later. A lot of these are pretty easy to process. Um, it's very papery kind of containers that they're sitting in. 
So it doesn't take much. And in terms of processing your seed, in general, you don't have to process your seed. You can have all this extra chaff. Chaff is just the $5 word for all that unwanted plant stuff that's not the actual seed. Um, berries, because berries are the exception to so many things, berries are the only seed you really have to process in order to get germination. Most of these other ones, just process it to a level that makes you happy. If, if you want pure live seed, go for it. You can get it down to purity, but you're not gonna harm, you're not gonna impact the germination if you have some of this extra chaff in there. All right, um, a subset of the shakers are the beaks. So it's the same kind of idea with an open container, except that these start off closed at the start of the season. And then all you need to do is watch for the capsule to open up. So when the beak is open, now it's time to collect your seed. Now, some of these, if you wanna process them, they can be really thick capsules. Like if any of you know Penstemon, the foxglove beard tongue, um, you know, some of those kind of species are really hard. The native hibiscus are, are pretty thick rinds in there. Um, so those types of seeds, a rolling pin can do it or a wood block. Some of these species you can spread out on a bottom of a Rubbermaid container and have let your kids have a dance party on it and break them up that way. So that works too. And then the last group of mama's boys I want to talk about tonight are your shattering seeds. Um, these guys, these don't have a container. There's no seed pod. There's no capsule around the seed. It's just these clusters of seeds like you can see here in this image. This is um, early meadow rue, one of the thalictrum species. So it's just a cluster of seeds sitting out there in the world. And once they get to the point where there's that peak ripeness, the whole cluster just shatters and the seed drops on the ground. Um, grasses are, are shattering seeds. That's another example. For these guys, you can look to see if any of the stems have dropped seed. And if they have, then the rest of them are probably also ripe. You can also tell by just using a gentle touch test that you should never have to fight these seeds. You shouldn't have to yank to get them off. They should come off with very gentle pressure. Um, some people talk about kind of tickling the seeds. It's, it's very light. If the seeds kind of shatter, the cluster shatters in your fingertips, then it's ripe and ready to collect. All right, so um, I want to look at a few species to kind of pull together what this information is I've just thrown at you. Uh, but to close out tonight, I would also love to know what you guys want to know more about. So think about questions you guys have if there's specific species you want to know more about, seed processing, propagation, any of that kind of stuff. Feel free to type it in the chat. I see there's some that have popped up and we will answer those very soon. But I want to jump down to wild geranium. Okay, um, wild geranium. I like wild geranium for shade gardens. One of the things I like about wild geranium is it has color. It has this lovely lavender pink flower. A lot of our spring woodland flora, especially those early species, you see a lot of white flowers and that's great. It reflects well in the shade and maybe you wanna do a white garden, that's great too. But for me, I like to have a pop of color. So this is one of those spring options that gives you a little bit of color. I also like that it's an early blooming shade species that is not ephemeral. So a lot of our early blooming species like um, trillium and bloodwort, these are species that pop up early in the year they're taking advantage of the fact that there's no leaves. There's a little bit extra sunlight reaching down to that forest floor, but they bloom, they set seed, and then they go dormant extra early. And every year I tend to get a call from somebody who says, oh my gosh, I just think I killed my trillium. And I look at the calendar and say, no, I think it just went dormant for the year. That's normal for ephemerals. And that can be really fun. Um, one of the great things about working outside is it keeps you, it, it gives that kind of seasonal appreciation that we're kind of jaded. We expect our grocery stores to have strawberries all year round, for example. Um, when you work with wild plants, it, it makes these things extra special when they do appear. But for gardening, then you can end up with some weird holes in July. So this is an option that will bloom early and hold that space all year round. Now, wild geranium is also called Cranesville. Um, that name is applied more often to the ornamental varieties but it comes from this seed capsule here because it looks like a really long bird beak. And at the base of that beak, there's these five little nubs. And what it actually is, is 
five ladles along the bill that just catapult up and slingshot the seed away. So after the seed is gone, you get this pretty little like chandelier with five slingshots that are up there. Um, but remember how I said ballistic seeds have the ready, aim, fire sequence. So ready is a green crane's bill. Aim is a brown crane's bill. Fire is the chandelier. So collect these when you have a brown crane's bill, put them in a paper bag, close it up with a chip clip, and you'll hear that sound of microwave popcorn as those seeds pop loose. All right, I wanted to take a look at some berries. We're gonna look at true and false Salomon seal here, because this is, we have some true and false species and that messes with people. And whenever you see true and false, basically what happens is a botanist is walking around and finds this new plant and goes, huh, I like that plant. I think I'm gonna call it Salomon seal. And then a second botanist walks around and says, hey, I think I found some of that Salomon seal over here. And botanist number one comes over and looks at it and she's like, it looks a little bit different. Something's not quite right, but they're really stinking similar. That's what true and false means. So the false is just the second one that was identified. It's the doppelganger species. Um, they're typically in a completely separate genus. So these species cannot hybridize. They can't crossbreed together. But they look really, really similar. So you'll notice true Salomon seal. You have these leaves that are alternating ladder-like rungs here. False Salomon seal has these leaves that are like alternating ladder-like rungs. True is going to have flowers underneath, underneath the stem here, and they're like little bells when they bloom and they turn into blueberries. False Salomon seal is at the end of the plant, and it's like little stars instead of bells, and then they turn into red berries. So they're very easy to tell your true from your false groups um, because the true Salomon seal species both have blueberries and the true false Salomon seal species we have have red berries. And just remember, these berries will go away fairly quickly. So if you want them, collect them and then remove this fruity bit so you end up with just this seed here and put it quarter inch in the soil sooner than later. Then I wanted to take a look at cardinal flower. <clears throat> so cardinal flower is a really great choice for rain gardens. It has this bold cardinal red color, which is fantastic. This is not a color you see often in our native flora. Most of the colors you see in our flowers are whites, yellows, and those purple blues. Because again, these flowers are about, hey, come pollinate me. Those are the colors that most of our insects can see. So if you wanna support a wide range of pollinators, you wanna be using that color palette. But it's kind of fun to put in a pop of color. And what's special about red, this is a color that bees can't see, but hummingbirds and uh, butterflies can see red. So that's not a bad thing. It just means this plant has said, I'm gonna take my chances that there's hummingbirds or butterflies around, otherwise I'm not making seed this year. Um, so this one does well in a rain garden. So does its sister species, blue lobelia. Both of these you wanna plant in the squishy edges of your rain garden. So you don't wanna plant them right in a pond, right on the edge of your water in those squishy places next to it is where they're happiest. Um, blue lobelia can also go a little bit drier as well. So you could put that in kind of a standard medium moisture pollinator garden. For both of these species, you will end up with something that looks like this. And you see these little fingers? This is what remains of the sepals or the calyx. Um, both of those are just the $5 words that mean the greenery behind the flower. And this is pretty common for a lot of plants that it blooms, the petals go away, and what you're left with is the greenery or what was green and is now turned brown. And that's usually where the ovary is sitting. Inside that greenery um, is, is where your seed's gonna be forming. So with this guy, these are beaks. So you're waiting for a capsule to open and tucked inside these feathery fingers, there's a little capsule. And when it opens, you'll see there's two chambers there, like a little pig nose and teeny tiny little seeds. And you know they're teeny tiny by looking at this millimeter ruler. These are lines on a millimeter ruler and the seeds are about the same width as the line on a millimeter ruler. Teeny tiny seeds. You can also tell they're tiny if you went to purchase this particular species. Anytime you go to buy seed from a commercial vendor, they'll sell it to you by the ounce. 
Um, this is a species they will try to sell to you by the quarter ounce or eighth of an ounce. And it's not because they're being stingy. It's because there's 500,000 seeds in an ounce of this species. So unless you really want a half a million cardinal flowers in your garden, buy only a quarter ounce. So that's a good way to kind of get a sense of size. And it's important to remember that, that some of our big seeds um, like acorns are really obvious what's the seed, but sometimes our seed looks like dust. So don't be put off by that. Just compare it to the guide to check for sure. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna pull up the chat and see what questions we have here. First question was about a blue way. Oh, just meaning like a river way. So when we're making those connections between preserves, they could be a greenway like parkland for terrestrial species, but we're also looking for options for a blue way for those more aquatic loving species or for you know birds that need waterways to go back and forth. So connections don't always have to be on land. Sometimes I cut seeds and let them finish drying in a paper bag due to my lack of time. Is this bad? No, that is not bad. Um, the only species that don't do well with drying out are berries. And then some of the species, let me go back to the seed categories. In the interest of time, I didn't want to cover every single category tonight. But let's look back at these alia zones. So um, a lot of your spring flora have this alia zone, which are the ant candy this like white gummy worm on the seed. This is bloodroot seed, by the way. So those early species generally don't handle drying out because ants disperse them and they're usually dispersed. The seed drops and the ants pick it up usually the same day. So those kind of species don't like drying out. Um, generally anything I collect in the early part of the year, I try to sow right away. So here, this section, the guide here, if you collect it before mid-June, sow it right away because these are often intolerant of dry storage. Your late June seeds can go a little bit longer, like a few weeks. So July and later, you got plenty of time. I recommend sowing it by January 1st. Um, if you get into propagating native plants, most, most native plants like to have stratification, meaning a cold treatment. And the reason for that, get briefly into propagation here, um, you know, we've had plenty of Octobers where we have 70 degrees and sunny with scattered rain showers coming through, which sounds like a great time to germinate, except we know winter is coming and these native plants know that too. So uh, most of our native seeds have a dormancy that protects the seeds and says, wait until you've had months of cold, damp conditions. Then when it gets to be warm, that's actually spring. That's when you should be germinating. Um, so I recommend you sow all of your seed by January 1st, just so you have really good results. Um, you can look for propagation books and websites, and a lot of them will go species by species. And that's great. If you really wanted to focus on just a few species, that's a really ideal way to learn about them. Me, I'm generally handling like 80 species at a time. So I'm looking for how can I generalize and simplify. And my general is my, my default setting is 90 days of below 40 degrees. Is, is really a good way to get a lot of our seeds to, to break dormancy. Kelly, can I ask you something in regards to that? A lot of people we talk to um, tell us that they have problems getting their plants started from seeds. They haven't had a lot of luck. And is that largely because they're maybe doing it at the wrong time of year? A lot of people tend to go out there in the spring with seed packets and yeah. So if you put it in in the spring or early summer, is it possible that by the time it's gonna cold stratify the next winter, those seeds could be too old or dried out or yeah. rotting? Okay. Yeah. All of those things. Or it could be that when it finally pops up after a year and a half, you've forgotten what you grew and you weed it out thinking it's something else. But yes, when you're if you're wondering what time to sow seed, Follow mama nature. If she's sowing the seed now, then now is a fine time to sow your seed. That's always the good default option. But that is a big issue that we, we think everything's like burpee seeds and well, you plant it in April or May and that doesn't work so well with our natives. Um, one place you can find species specific information for free is Prairie Moon Nursery. They have it right on their website with those germination codes. Um, there's some websites out there. Uh, Tom Clothier is a website I've used in the past. Um, there's some more detailed ones on the Forest Service website. There's a bunch of books. 
it depends on how far that you want to go down that rabbit hole. But in general, try to sow your seeds right away if you're unsure and if you have the time to do that. Otherwise, try to get everything, all your fall seed, try to get it in by January 1st and you should have much better luck. Um, the other challenge that I find is most people try to bury seeds because again, we're used to growing vegetables and we expect that. When I have a greenhouse, I typically put everything on top of the soil. Outside, that's not always a good idea because you might have critters coming through eating your seed. The birds usually show up right after we sow a bunch of seed. Um, but just try to sow it, like if you sow it right before a snowfall, that's perfect because the snow will pack it, you'll get really good soil contact, it'll get a protective layer so the birds don't eat it right away. And that can be really useful. But a lot of it- so Even if we had an early blooming plant, such as say, uh, beard tongue and the seeds formed earlier we should pretty much take the seeds when they form but not plant them till fall you can plant them as soon as the seeds as soon as the seeds are there you can plant it okay it's okay so we tend to hold on to stuff till fall because we're putting together like our restoration mixes are usually at least 100 species mm -hmm. so i don't have time to make 100 visits to a forest preserve mm -hmm. So that's why we do one big mix in the fall. Um, so I'll do like a, I'll do my early seeds as they come, you know, those kind of May and June seeds. I try to get them out as soon as I can. But then everything else, I try to just load it into big mixes. We might be spreading them with a tractor over 80 acres. So that kind of stuff we'll do in the fall or early winter. But if you're only handling one or two species, try to sow it right away. You will absolutely have the best success if you do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, those, those yeah. early season yeah. species, um, not only are they tend to be intolerant of dry storage, they also often have a requirement of a warm treatment and a cold treatment because they're used to having summer, then winter, and then finally germinating the following spring. So yeah, when in doubt, follow mama nature. She knows what she's doing. Gotcha. Yeah. Right. Good questions, everybody. All right, um, let's see upcoming volunteer events. Oh, yeah, I can share that. But if you just go to lcfpd.org, right on our calendar, you'll see restoration work days. So if anyone wants to come to Barrington tomorrow, I will be collecting seeds in Grassy Lake Forest Preserve. On Saturday, I'll be at uh, Rollins Savannah in Gray's Lake. Um, but you know, check out all of your local forest preserve districts are collecting seed right now. Absolutely. Um, I'm trying to think, I don't remember where I'm going to be next week. I'm bouncing around all over Lake County. The question about 50% of each plant or 50% of a population. Oh, yes, good question. So when you are collecting your seeds, we recommend 50% and it's 50% of the population. So this is definitely a judgment call. Uh, you kind of eyeball it and just say, well, you know, maybe I missed the first 50%, it already sowed itself. So I'll collect everything that's left. Or maybe I'll take every other stem, maybe I'll take half every plant, maybe I'll collect two feet of plants and then skip two feet, just, just to make sure you're keeping some seed behind. Examples of ballistic plants. So we looked at the wild geranium together. Um, another one are violets do this. And the most of the violets that you have a pod that's on a stem. So it starts off nodding and then raises its head up to the sky and then splits open to ballistically shoot the seed. Um, flocks are ballistic. Hmm, trying to think what else there's. Oh, touch me not the jewelweed species. These are ripe right now and they're super fun to play with because you can really feel the power in jewelweed. Most common you'll see the orange jewelweed. It's kind of like a trumpet shaped flower. And then you get these fat little like bean pods. Um, these grow on a lot of those kind of squishy wetland edges. So yeah, if you see any of those, just, just play with them and you'll be impressed with the power that you'll find with the touch me not, which is why that gets that name. Um, jewelweed is of course referring to the flowers. What are the red beetles I see in my swamp milkweed? Are they friend or foe? Oh, excellent question. So there's um, milkweed beetles. There's also milkweed bugs. These are our friends of your milkweeds. They are native insects and like the monarch caterpillars, they eat the milkweeds to get that milky sap, which is actually more of a latex. Um, but that's a toxic chemical to most things. And the birds have figured out, hey, I don't want to eat those orange butterflies. They don't taste very good. And the beetles are doing the exact same thing. They can be 
you, you tend to get a lot that can be very localized on your milkweed plants. Sometimes they chew through the pods and get to your seeds and that can be a little obnoxious, but most of the time they're not usually, they're not usually killing the plants. They might just impact a little bit of your seed production, but even with that, it's usually not a problem. So I don't typically worry about those. Um, you can get a lot of aphids on your milkweed plants. I don't worry about those too much. If it bothers you, you can always use soapy water to um, knock off any of these insects. I have a huge amount of wild geranium. Oh, nice. Oh, yes, I can look for the Smithsonian seed video. I think it was called like floating plants or something. Um, let's see. Floating seeds. YouTube videos. So oh, I can answer questions and we'll get back to them. But uh, yeah, it's a great video. How can we store seed? Can we freeze them? You can freeze some of them. Um, again, these plants are used to being outside in the winter where they deal with that. For most of our seeds, we typically need to do low temperature, low humidity if we're going to store them for a while. Um, any of those July and later collections, you can store just in a cool, dry location. Those early seeds, I would suggest you don't typically store them. You just try to sow them right away. If you need to store them, you can try to refrigerate them like I talked about for berries. Um, you, can also, um, you can also pack them in with soil or vermiculite or peat moss with a little bit of moisture. So you're actually kind of starting the stratification process and that might work out better. What is the preferred method for common milkweed seed germination? I've tried many methods, including cold scar scarification without much success. Okay, so milkweeds, I mean, as I said, I typically do cold uh, stratification for at least 90 days because I just have so many different species I'm dealing with. You could also try putting it in a pot or a tray um, and putting the whole thing outside, just close it up with a plastic bag or something and keep an eye on it. As long as you don't get rodents in there, you can do, just do it in your own yard. Um, you don't need to bury that seed. You can a little bit. The, the, the kind of baseline rule for burying native seeds is you bury them as deep as they are wide, which is not very deep at all. And I usually put all the fluffy ones right on top of the soil. Um, the other thing that can trip people up with milkweed seed is how you process it. There's some people who think the best way to process your milkweed seed is to light it on fire. I don't recommend that. <laughs> um, when I, I used to run our native seed nursery for Lake County, and that was the first time I had pounds and pounds of milkweed to deal with. And so I was asking other places how they handle it. And they said, oh yeah, you light it on fire. It's like a party trick, it's fun. I said, well, have you tried, you know, yes, we're in fire adapted ecosystems, but have you tried germinating that seed? And they're like, well, no, we actually haven't. Now that you mention it, we tend to use the fire on this one species of milkweed and we're not really seeing it show up in our mixes. And we thought maybe it was just slow to germinate. So I did a little test myself, um, just like a nine by 13 pan with milkweed and fluff and with a Bic lighter. And I almost burned my eyebrows off. It was so hot and so fast. And I had taken seed from the exact same collection bag and hand cleaned it. I had great germination with the hand cleaned one, the fire one, I had no germination. And some of the seeds looked charred, some of them looked perfect, and it only burned for about three seconds. That stuff, that fluff is so flammable. Um, it makes a good fire starter if you watch your eyebrows. But um, I don't recommend using fire. For processing milkweed seeds, if you collect them when they're fresh and they haven't fluffed up yet, when they've like just split open, usually the seeds are overlapped like a kind of a pine cone look. And then you can just clean them off with your thumb really easily because the, the, the fluff is still kind of damp and stuck together. The other method you can use is a light shop vac. Make sure that your vacuum is cleaned out, that there's no other garbage in there because it'll suck up seed fluff and all. But that's usually enough to separate the fluff from the seed or you can sow it with the fluff. Um, when I did that in the greenhouse, I had a little bit more likely to have some mildew forming on the, on the tray because of the fluff would hold on to the moisture. So that's something to consider. Um, but yeah, generally just a 90 day stratification sowed on top of the soil. And I typically had pretty good germination with that. 
can the guide be purchased? It is not for sale. Thank you for that. Um, but this is free. You are free to share this with your friends and frenemies alike. It's a PDF. So you can print it out if you want, or you can have it on your mobile phone so that you can always pull it up at any point when you have a seed emergency and need to know more and zoom in on the pictures. But it's just a, a free resource for you guys. And did you receive it when you received your, your confirmation that you had signed up for the organization? I mean, for the, the, the event, everybody um, received that link when they got the confirmation. So if you did not receive the link, send us an email and let us know that you did not receive it and we will get that to you. Kathy, I also just posted it into the chat. So Wonderful. if you scroll up a little bit, then you'll find it. Thank you guys for making this all happen, helping share this. Um, we are planning on putting this on our LCFBD website and um, we're also going to be sharing it with a bunch of our partners and friends and using it in some of our um, uh, some of our programming as well. Here's the video, by the way. So let me grab this link. And put that in the chat so you guys can watch the 1812 Overture video. So these are violets. Our native violets do this exact same thing. And this is a sister species of the Tuxminox. Kelly, Kelly, can you pause that for just a minute? All we're seeing is your as the garden guide on the screen. Oh shoot! Oh, so you share only shared the window. If you can reshare or all right, let me stop share and I think I also need. I don't know if I set this up to share sound. So you guys yeah, might hear this. You should be able to do it on the fly. Just oh, there uh, look for the, there are a couple of button, buttons. One is to optimize and one is to share sound. Okay. Can you see the video now? The I can see the video now. <laughs> that's going on out there and we don't even know it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, tips for propagation of royal catchfly. So royal catchfly is um, a endangered state endangered species. So very cool that you have that one. It's one of those gorgeous red flowering species. Um, it's, it is a short-lived perennial, so that is one that would be good to grow. I've grown that in the greenhouse with a standard stratification and had good luck with that. So same kind of deal. I would recommend give yourself at least 90 days of cold stratification. The seeds are pretty small on that one, so I put it on top of the soil, um, and that would help reseed it. They'll have kind of that sticky, the calyx, that so the greenery behind the flower, when it, it turns kind of beige when it's ripe, and it's usually kind of sticky. That's the catch fly part of the name but the seeds will be sitting inside there. Um, so cold stratification, the best time of year, we covered that. There's the garden guide. Winter sowing is perfect for native plants. Yes, it is. Um, yeah, so Prairie Moon Nursery, they, sell, they share all that information readily on their website and in their catalog. Um, most of the nurseries try to keep it really simple and just say so in the fall, which isn't wrong. And it's certainly a simpler method, but Prairie Moon details it all. Planted several species of natives this year. Some didn't bloom, such as world milkweeds. Will they survive the winter and bloom in the future? Um, so if your seeds didn't germinate or they didn't bloom, um, 
you know, a lot of, if you start these from seed, they may not bloom the first year, especially if you're growing them directly in the soil. If you start them in a greenhouse with some fertilizer, you'll have a higher percentage of species that'll bloom right away. Um, but it's not unusual for milkweeds to wait until year two. All the milkweeds, that's often the case that, you know, it's year two or three before they start blooming. So if your plant looks healthy, or looks healthy through most of the year, it should be starting to go dormant now, um, then I would expect it'll come back and bloom. World milkweed is a really cute little white milkweed plant. Um, it does kind of move around a bit. So that's one of them. If I was to plant it in a garden bed, um, I would put it in kind of a wild garden bed, which is actually my favorite style of gardening. I, um, I like the aesthetic of wild spaces. I know it's surprising, uh, but also because there's less weeding. So I tend to just do a garden bed and just put a clear edge on it and let the plants find their niche. So that's one that'll move around a bit on you, but cute little milkweed plant, good choice. I have had monarch caterpillars on world milkweeds many times. Um, how often do plants that have a color variation such as yellow form of butterfly milkweed come true from seed? Good question. Um, you know, if you're having these color variations, a lot of times you're starting to get into the realm of native ours, which are the native cultivars. Um, that can be a really interesting thing. It could be a fun way to play around with some of these plants, but they've been bred for certain characteristics that some human thought was a cool idea. So it could be that you get color variations. It could be that it's a sturdier stock or that it blooms longer, um, but it is certainly a human influenced choice. So in general, I recommend if people try to stay closer to natives whenever possible, um, you'll support more of your pollinators. Changing the color of your milkweed if it's a yellow butterfly milkweed, you might actually support more pollinators because yellow is seen by more species. Um, I don't know that I've seen that one. I've seen a lot of variations, different shades of orange, but it, it depends on if it's, if it's sold specifically as a yellow form of butterfly milkweed, I would expect that the nursery or the whoever created that particular um, native R has bred specifically for that trait. So it should consistently display that trait in the future because that's what they're trying to market to you. You will see some natural variations. A lot of the natural variations you see is every once in a while you get a white form. So I've seen cardinal flower that is occasionally white instead of bold red. I've seen that in um, spiderwort, which is usually royal purple. I've seen it in blazing stars, which are usually kind of that pink purple. And I've seen them occasionally go white. Um, we're starting to see some of that. The New England aster that's blooming this time of year is usually royal purple. And the pink variety is a natural variation, but it's getting selected for by the nurseries to add as a fun pop of color. So they're kind of artificially boosting that particular color in the nursery mix. Um, and those do seem to breed true. So I would expect that they probably will continue to do that and stay with that uh, particular. Do I know of a pink and white jewelweed? Is that native? Um, the ones that are native to Northern Illinois are either orange or yellow. I would believe that there's a pink and white form, but I have not seen that. Can you start them inside your home? Absolutely, you can start seeds inside the house. Um, if you're gonna start seeds, you typically, most of the native seeds want to have a fairly warm starting temperature, like 65, 70 degrees daytime. You and once they've germinated, okay, let me back up for a second. First, you have to do the stratification. So that cold stratification you can do by putting your pot or your tray outside, or you can put it in the refrigerator. And we often start like our greenhouse stuff, we start in the refrigerator, but we do it in a plastic bag and then do, um, do them with damp sand. So like sand castle consistency in a plastic bag, put it in the fridge. Because then instead of an entire tray, maybe you just have like a cup of material that you have to put in your refrigerator. So either way, you can do outside or refrigerator to do that stratification and then um, put them in a place where you're gonna have daytime temperatures that are at least 65 degrees, 70 degrees, somewhere in that range. And then once they start growing, you may need to supplement with some extra light depending on the time of year that you're starting your seed. Um, you know, like you can start seed in November but you don't have that much daylight. So most of the time in our greenhouse, we would start seed, we'd sow it like March 1st and it'd be ready to plant by mid-May. Depends on your, your, your growing media. Um, look for like a seed starting media. that's usually really finely ground, like a peat based or coconut based media rather than real dirt. 
that can help your root formation grow a little bit stronger and faster because it's light material rather than a clay soil. Um, yeah, and, and start it off that way. And we usually do like a medium rate of fertilizer. You don't need tons, but you need some kind of food usually to add to that soilless growing media and you can start them inside and that's kind of fun. Once you harvest the seeds from Monarda and milkweed, should you cut back the long stems or just leave them be? Um, that's up to you. So a lot of times we encourage people to leave stuff up because it's good food and habitat for birds. But a lot of that of what they're feeding on is the seed itself. So um, if your aesthetic is to cut things back in the fall, you absolutely can. Um, if you're leaving some seed behind, then maybe leave it up to support some, some birds in the winter time. But you can do either, especially if you're harvesting the seed. Whatever your aesthetic is uh, would be fine. You're not going to hurt the plant either way. I didn't get first year germination on legumes such as Amorpha or Baptisia in my plug trays after one winter. Should I leave them for another year or are they likely non-viable? So legumes, legumes are, have some extra treatments that usually have to go in. Um, they typically have really thick seed coats. So one way to deal with that is before you sow your seed, you rough them up with sandpaper, like 20, 30 seconds of a medium grit sandpaper is usually enough to wear down that seed coat. And you can test it by then dropping them into a cup of water. And after 24 hours, they should swell up to show you that water is able to get inside the seed. And if you do that, then you only need 10 days of cold treatment and they'll germinate right away. The other option with legumes is you sow them outside in the winter. And then in that case, you don't wanna sandpaper them because the freeze thaw cycles will break down that seed coat. So if that's what you're doing with your legumes, or if they didn't get that freeze thaw, if you tried to start these inside the house, I would put them outside this winter because maybe it just wasn't able to get through the seed coat. Um, the seed coat's still too thick, too, too solid to stimulate germination. So try them for another year. It never hurts to try your seeds for a second year. Um, no promises that they're still viable, but a lot of these seeds, they hang until the conditions are right. Um, and it doesn't hurt to save them for another year and wait and see. And even here's something else I've learned about native seeds. Again, seeds, these native plants have so many variations, just like I was talking about, like those fluffy seeds, how you have some that are fully poofed and some that are blooming and some that are kind of half fluff, all in the same plant, all at the same time. This is what helps these wild plants adapt and survive. They're not GMO plants. They have these variations on purpose. So I've had trays where I thought I got all the seedlings out of it. And I thought, well, for kicks, let's hold on to this tray a second year. And I'll get a small percentage of seed that were lingering in the soil and waited until year two to germinate. This is a great survival technique. If you have a really horrible year, you still have a little bit sitting on the bench waiting to germinate next year. So yeah, always play around with this stuff. You never know what you'll find. You're welcome for the video. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Um, for milkweed, 90 day cold stratification, meaning start in March or before January 1st. So the stratification should happen before you want to start germinating. So when I talked about how I started in the greenhouse March 1, the stratification happened already. So we put them in the fridge, you know, back in like now, October, November, and then pull them out, um, you know, in spring. So yes, 90 day cold stratification in our bags and then we would sow it damp sand seed and all March 1st in the greenhouse with those temperatures set to be like 65, 70 degree days. Things usually germinate within a few weeks depending on the species and then we plant them out by mid-May. I've seen yellow butterfly weed in natural environments. Cool, I'm gonna have to look for this. Even seen some site suggestions now. Cool things. Awesome. I'm glad you guys are seeing some cool stuff and purple cardinal flowers. I just saw some pictures of that online recently that apparently cardinal flower and blue lobelia occasionally hybridize and you get this funky magenta color. So that's something I have not seen in person yet. We tried to propagate it and it came out red. Did it? Okay. Hmm. No. So that one did not breed true. No.
Oh, we got an answer to the impatience question. Impatience Belforia is pink and white. Very cool. That um, that is the one I just looked it up. That's the one I was thinking of. Is that a native? I'm not familiar with that species. Oh, okay. Probably not then. It just I heard it called jewelweed once. You know, the place to look for some of this stuff, oh, that's pretty, orchid impatience, um, is USDA plants. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this website. I don't know, you guys, can you see my Bing search that I'm doing right now or is that mm -hmm. hidden? Yes. I'm bringing up the USDA plant site and this has maps showing where you can find the range for plants and it'll tell you whether things are um, native or introduced. Hmm, didn't like it. There it is, I just misspelled it. Belfour's touch me not. And it should pull up a map, there we go, showing where you find it. So it looks like it's been introduced. Oh, but it's in Wisconsin where I live and on the West Coast. So that is a not a native species, but very pretty. And again, we don't hate every non-native species. Maybe that's one that does well in garden beds, but it's not going to be invasive. Thanks for showing me that. That's great. And the hummingbirds really love it. Mm -hmm. And it just, I got one plant once and it receded all around. It's a very nice plant. Nice. Thanks for the tip. Uh, I have some wild hyacinths. I started from seed and starter trays. They died back and I was going to leave them in trays over the winter. Should I leave them out in the tray or should I put them in the garage to protect them? Good question. So hyacinths, anything in that lily or, you know, broad lily family, they're, they're very, very slow, very slow to mature. Um, so it could be several years till you have actual flowers. In terms of leaving them in the tray, um, hyacinth tends to be little bulbs, so they're probably not very big and you want to make sure they have some insulation. It's really a question of um, how much soil is around the bulb. If you feel like you have a pretty decent amount of soil in there, that should protect them and you could put them outside. If you're not sure, you can put them in your garage too. That would work. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it's how much is it going to get frost heaved or um, the other thing to bear in mind if you're putting things outside is rodent protection, depending on whether that's an issue for you or not. And it may not be where you live, um, but I had issues with that when we had thousands of plants we were overwintering and then the voles were like, sweet, we got Christmas feast. Um, that's pretty sad. So just uh, something to think about. If you think you might have rodents digging in your trays, then it might be worth putting some hardware cloth on top to keep them from digging in there. Um, but as long as we don't you probably should be fine putting them outside, especially if it's near your house. There's always going to be a little bit of a microclimate right next to your house because some of that heat is radiating out, um, which is certainly different than the middle of a forest preserve where I was storing trays outside. So I think you'll be fine outside. Oh, and thank you for sharing the USDA plants websites. Um, is this being recorded? It is being recorded. Um, you'll have to talk to Kathy and the Sagmarine folks. About so sharing. we have, are, are you okay if we share this on our public YouTube channel? We have a members only part of our website, but for the people who are not members, it, you'll be able to find it in about a week on our public YouTube channel. Just look up Sagmarine. Great. Terrific. And with that, I do just want to add for our members, we did put a link in there. Um, Anybody who is interested in getting some of these seeds out of your yards and putting them in envelopes, uh, we are considering uh, planning a Saturday morning seed exchange and walk at Lake Catherine. So anybody who's interested in giving this a try and sharing some seeds with other members of SAG Moraine, please send an email. And I have we have the link in the chat to Donna McCash at sagmoraine.org. And if we have uh, a number of people interested, we're gonna, we'll try to harvest these seeds and share them. So Kelly, that was spectacular. Thank you so much for that. The resources, your talk. I just have to take that, that guide and go outside and do this slow. Now, what did she say this one was? <laughs> 
Well, thank you again for the invitation. And you guys, you were the inspiration for the creation of this guide. So although we're sharing it widely, you have, you know, the glory of saying we were the reason it was even made. <laughs> really? You were going to make it until us? Yeah, you asked for this. We're and I was like, hey, we should do this. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. This was fantastic. And thanks to everybody for joining us and go out there and get those native seeds in the ground. <laughs> good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Kelly.